put words out there that you believe in. So like if you always are saying something that you're you're so true about, you, you believe in, like you're never going to put yourself in a situation where you're like, oh crap. And I just had to keep reminding myself of that. Like, you know, there's a couple of times where I would be like, oh yeah, I like that show too. Never seen it. You know, like <laughs> Because why do you put yourself in these like situations where you just think for a second, like, oh man, I have to. Um, and so kind of just always like whatever I'm saying is like the truth. And then I never really feel like I can't sleep at night. Hey everyone, it's Vasavi Kumar, licensed therapist and your host of the Being Human with Vasavi podcast. For over two decades, I have been relentless when it comes to understanding and figuring out why we think the way we do, what stops us from going after our dreams, and how to get anything we want in life. From Mind Body Green to VH1 to Fox News and some of the top rated podcasts out there, my message has always been consistent. When you know yourself, you can do anything. I've helped thousands of people from all walks of life, from stay-at-home moms to entrepreneurs to people in recovery, to start thinking differently and change themselves from the inside out. And I'm going to do the same for you. Whether it's through the interviews I have with my guests or answering your questions right here on the show, here's my promise to you. If you're willing to take action on even 1% of what you hear today, your life will be unrecognizable. Get ready for unfiltered and unscripted conversations with some of the brightest people in mental health, marketing, relationships, and business. We're pulling back the curtain so you can see what it really takes to be human and become the person you want to be here on the Being Human with Vasavi podcast. I loved this interview because it really shows that it doesn't matter what happens in your life. It doesn't because at the end of the day, it really is up to us how we choose to look at our life, how we choose to look at any situation moment to moment. My guest has gone through a lot in her life and she has risen above that. And I want you to really hear this, that no matter what you are going through, what you have gone through, that you too have the courage and you too have the choice to rise above whatever has been going on in your life or has gone on in your life. My guest, Dr. Rabina Tahir, is a board-certified chiropractor, content creator, and co-founder of the Positivity Charge, a women's wellness community. In grade school, she was the target of bullying. But working through the emotions that came with this experience gave her a sense of empowerment. In her adult life, she realized that these same emotions continued, but for different reasons, work, life, and love. A pivotal moment in her life was when she tested positive for BRCA1, the breast cancer gene her mother has. Dr. Rabina witnessed the ups and downs of her mother beating cancer five times. This only intensified her views of women's health with one goal in mind, to heal with resilience and a positive mental attitude. Dr. Rubina Tahir is a contributor to Thrive Global Community and has contributed to the Huffington Post blog, Reader's Digest, PHL 17, Cosmopolitan, and Men's Health Magazine. I cannot even emphasize how much you're going to love this episode. This woman is real. This woman is unfiltered. We had a great conversation. There are a lot of great nuggets, so take out your paper and pen, your journal, put on your headphones, go for a walk while you listen to this and get ready to be inspired and give yourself permission to be human and become the person you want to be. Dr. Rubina, I am, I can call you doctor, right? You want to be called doctor or just Rubina? You can call me Rubina. I love it. It's so funny. My mom, um, my mom is a retired cardiologist and she still goes by Dr. Kumar. She does. Oh, really? She so refuses. Should I be doctor? Oh, you I like to switch it up. Well, I'll you switch know, it up. <laughs> you know, us brown people, we love our, uh, you know, we love the letters after our name, before our name. So I'm just kind of in the habit of, uh, of saying that. So I want to say thank you so much for being on here. Um, I wanted to have you on here because not only the work that you're putting out into the world, you know, with your blog and your events that you do under the positivity charge, but when I first met you and then we spoke, I felt like there was such a beautiful energy about you, so vibrant, so real. And I was like, you know what? I have to have her on the podcast. And one of the things that I want to get straight into and just ask you, I read this, I actually read this on your website, where you talk about sitting alone at recess. Um, I, I believe that what the pain that we go through in life can either paralyze us, or it can really be the catalyst for us to create something from that pain. 
So I'd love to hear from you just what was that experience like sitting alone at recess? I mean, it's terrifying. You know, um, I'm in public school. I grew up in Canada, so I say, I say public school, but, you know, just sitting in the bathroom crying day after day turned into weeks it turned into months uh, you know you're afraid to go on the playground because nobody wants to talk to you or people call you poop because your skin color I mean like imagine this being one of the first things you're trying to deal with you know as a very young child trying to you know navigate the world I mean there's other things you're thinking about you know, in school, you know, like, do I look okay? Do I have the right shoes? Do I bring my backpack? Like, what's this math business we're doing? You know what I yeah. mean? Like, you're trying to figure out all this knowledge. Um, and really, nobody, nobody talked to me or played with me for three months. And it was just like a group of girls. And I just sat in the bathroom stall. And then one day, and I don't know how it happened. I just was like, if I continue to cry in the bathroom stall, that's all that's going to happen. Like, that's my life, crying in a bathroom stall. Surely there must be something else that I can do. So I went outside. I went outside, and it was me, and I'm like, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to bring a book. Um, I'm just going to hang out, eat a snack, you know. And people started to see, wow, Rabina's coming outside. And one day, this girl came over, and she was like, can I sit with you? Greatest thing I could hear because I wasn't doing anything crazy. I was just being myself. And I'm like, oh my God, this works. I can be myself. I can be myself. I can attract the people that like to be themselves too. And we can sit here in our own strength and learn how to navigate life and enjoy life. And you know, and that one girl turned into four girls. Those four girls go to high school. Those four girls go to college and they're still friends. And it's this strength chain but you have to learn to look for it. What I'm struck by is how, okay, so first of all, how old were you when all of this kind of went down, like eating in the bathroom, hanging out in the bathroom at school? Like seven, eight, nine, ten. So what I'm really struck by is at such a young age, um, how you had the awareness to just have that mindset shift, you know, to be like, well, if I'm going to be sitting in here, I'm going to be sitting in here forever. Like at such a young age, you kind of, you, like, you coached yourself to, to, to get out of the bathroom and to go hang out and you put yourself out there and then this girl says, let's hang out. Yeah, it's crazy. I think about that all the time. I don't know, well, or maybe I should say I didn't know, you know, where I got it from, but I think now as an adult, I do know where I got it from. And so it's sort of the, another piece of the puzzle of, of Rubina or Dr. Rubina, whoever I'm gonna be today. But, you know, my mom's a cancer survivor. So I was two years old when she was first diagnosed with breast cancer. So my life growing up was, you know, dealing with bullying, dealing with trying to figure out life. And then also, oh, my mom's really sick. How come no one else's mom is really sick? Why do I stay in on the weekends? Why am I not playing with my friends? Why is my dad making my lunch? Why do I have to make my lunch? So I think that that kind of experience kind of gave me sort of some clues, you know, like if you, you've got to figure it out. Like there was just some days where my dad was like, I need help. You know what I mean? And then it happened again when I was 19. So to have it happen then going into, you know, like your womanhood, your adulthood, that was another kick in the butt that like really sort of saved my existence. You know, um, it, it was hard. It was hard to see that. And my mom was always really positive. So she always took it upon herself to figure things out. So if a doctor told her something, she's like, well, I better go ask like 10 other people what they think about this. Or, you know, I'm, I'm in pain. Oh, you want to give me a pain pill? Okay, well, maybe I'll try acupuncture, massage, chiropractic. So then that kind of fits into the whole thing about how I became a chiropractor. But I saw it in my mom. I don't think I understood it, but I was like, let me just give this a try. It seems to be working for someone very close to me. And it's like a very, very safe you know, example. I think about the people listening to our story, right? To, to, I, I think about the people listening to you, hearing your story. And what I really want them to get is trauma affects us, can, can, can happen at any, at any point in our life. For you, it happened at such a young age. I believe, you know, being a licensed therapist and I'm, I'm, you, you being in the medical field, you know, um, pain changes us right? And so at a, as a two-year-old having a mom who was going through cancer and like from a young age, like having to make your own lunch and having like, you know, you're, you did not have that like just innocent childhood where you had someone take it, like you had to start fending for yourself, not because obviously you were neglected, but because your mother was sick. And, you know, I, I always say this, I'm like, you got to turn your pain into power, 
right? And so even at a young age, you have to grow up quick, right? You, you, you literally have to grow up quick, right? Because you're making your lunches, you're doing things that an adult should be doing for you. Obviously your mother couldn't, your father was obviously tending to you, work, and your mom. I love what you said about how um, your mom takes, you know, she took it upon herself to be resourceful because don't you feel like, and I'm, I'm sure you as a chiropractor advises to your patients also, like a lot of times we just kind of take one doctor's advice and we're like, oh, that's it. But your mom seemed to be someone who's a very um, like self-advocate, you know, she was self-advocating. So like, even if a doctor said one thing to her, she was like, well, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to advocate for myself. I'm going to be an educated patient, right? So do you, do you encourage your patients to do that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I do health talks all the time where I say, you know, you are in control of your own body. You get to make this decision. And you have to think about the people that you're seeing. Like if you go to an acupuncturist, they're going to want to use a needle, right? Like that's what they do. If you come see a chiropractor, I use my hands. Same with the massage therapist. If you go to a surgeon, you're going to get a surgical consult. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that go have one, but then go see your chiropractor, your acupuncturist, your massage therapist, Reiki, yoga, find what you like. And that's what I say to my patients all the time. If you don't like me, if you don't like what I'm doing, you can't see me. You're never going to get better. Mm -hmm. And my mom understood this. Mind you, I think that when you're kind of in that much pain and you've had a double mastectomy, you know, you're, you're like, I got to find it. Like that's just, it, it's a light switch. It's very fast. Other people, we can take our time. For her, it was like, I got to do this now. I, I really appreciate you saying this so much because I, I truly believe pain is a great motivator, right? Oftentimes, most people, right? And I'm, 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 you don't have to agree with this, but like most people don't have to change because they're cushy, right? Because they're comfortable. And your mom had a double mastectomy. You better believe she was like, I need to do something about this because the pain, pain is a great motivator. Um, it doesn't mean you have to sit in the pain, right? You don't have to sit in the pain, but you can use that and use that to channel the positive outcome that you want in your life. Do you think a lot of what you went through, um, watching your mom go through pain, but uh, you know, you know, just really step into her own power and you kind of channeling that yourself, do you think that was the motivator behind you starting the Positivity Charge blog and all the events that you do? It definitely. I mean, positivity saved my life. And not to, I'm not saying positivity is, you know, you have to be a fluffy person. It's being able to look at negativity or adversity um, and say, I got this, you know, I can figure it out. Or, you know, I feel pain, I feel pleasure, or those are the big motivators, whatever it is, like take something, roll with it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and positivity just kind of is a reflection of my mom, you know what I mean? I can't believe she was so positive you know her cancer came back five times she's still alive wow um and she's like full of life she's like what are we gonna do today let's do this let's do that let's go see my grandkids let's and you're just kind of like why shouldn't you hate life like i thought about that a lot i was like shouldn't you hate life and and she does it and i'm like okay you know she's on to something again here you know what i mean and so we just have this decision and things are not handed to us and i think i also learned that from my mom, you know, people kind of think like, okay, I'm putting all this good out here, you know, things are really, you know, going to come my way automatically. No, you still have to lift up rocks. You still have to find what you want. You have to accept it. You have to take it in. You have to practice it. You have to live, eat, breathe it. You know, it's a, it's hard work at the end of the day. And this is what I tell my patients. You, you got to put the work in. It's a moment to moment choice. And I love that you say that because there really is, there's also toxic positivity, right? Where okay, I'm just going to say positive things to myself in the mirror and life is going to be great. It's like, no, I love that you said you got to put in the work and it, it is a choice, right? Like I have, and I'm sure you can, you, you maybe have experienced this too. Like you can have the initial thought be negative, right? You can have that initial thought. The work is in that moment to flip from that negative to that positive thought, that, that contracting thought, the one that contracts us and is ego-based to the more positive thought, the one that's more expansive. Yeah, I agree. And you can be negative. You know, you can be negative for 24 hours, but you better hope that you switch that around. You know, I'm not saying that you should never eat a, a pint of Ben and Jerry's or, you know, cry all night, do all those things, but change it, you know, learn your coping time. Some people need a couple hours. I'm the type of person where something happens, I need a day. You know, I really need, I need a day. I will give it that to myself, I'll honor it, I'll own it. The next day has to be different. Um, some people need five minutes, I envy those people, but they weren't born like that. 
they practice, they spent time, you know, getting to know themselves. And so you got to process this information, whatever it is. And I always give the example of women empowerment. I love meeting other people. I loved when you reached out um, and we had this conversation. I'm like, there's so much energy. I feel the same way. I'm like, this is amazing. This is exactly what we need to do. So there's a lot of people that walk around talking about women empowerment, right? Okay, well, when was the last time you, you talked to another woman? When was the mm. last time you talked on the phone? When was the last time you did a Zoom chat? When was the last time you supported um, a small business owner? You know, and then it's like, well, no, I, I love women empowerment. Okay, you love it. You just said it. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to me. When is the last time you caught your jealousy looking at another woman's success and turned it around and actually appreciated that woman's success rather than being jealous, right? So it all starts with how we, I love that you said that because yeah, like it's easy to be like, I empower women. It's another thing to actually like reach out to that woman, have a conversation, congratulate, celebrate her success. And that's a lot of what you do at the positivity charge, right? Like on the blog with the content that you put out there. Yes, the positivity charge came out of, you know, being very real. I thought that there was this void in health, in the health and wellness industry, like with retreats and conferences. So a lot of the stuff was like, you know, are you vegan? Are you, you know, paleo? Do you like yoga? Do you like Pilates? Like, why can't you like everything? And I'm going to be really honest, and I don't always say that, but, you know, now is kind of the time where I wanted to say it. Wellness is not diverse. It really bothered me. Mm. You know? And so I was like, I need to have this all-inclusive space where everybody is welcome. You know, wellness is not one hair color, one race, one body type. And so Parish and I, she's the co-founder of the Positivity Charge. We created this safe, inclusive, honest, gritty, real space. And our first conference had 65 people. You know, last year we're sitting around 300 women. And every woman who comes to this event, and we always like feedback, so we, you know, make sure we're, we're asking all these questions. We get all this feedback. It's so diverse. I felt so comfortable. This is so different from everything else I've been to. It's because we look at mindset. You can't be a successful vegan. You can't be successfully sober. You can't be successfully working out every single day if your mindset isn't right. So why isn't there a conference based out of this strong mindset? Um, wellness, we talk about business, we talk about motivation, we have the big thinker track, the serial entrepreneur, the wellness leader. So it's this place where, you know, you start with your brain, okay? And then you get your brain and your mouth and your body all doing the same thing. Then you're walking the walk, talking the talk, then you're authentic and shit's going to happen. <laughs> if you have to define that mindset, right? So if you had to define what that mindset is, so our audience can really walk away with like, shit, I really need to change my mindset from this, whatever it currently is, to this, for me to get going, what would that mindset be? You, you gotta be able to one, think on your feet, and two, there's always an answer. You know what I mean? And like the first thing you're thinking is probably not the right thing or the best thing for you. So what, what's your 20th thought? You know, are you really digging into the depths of your mind? Are you uncovering all the layers? Your mind is a very big space. All of the answers are, are within you. So are you going to take the time to get to know yourself, get to know your mindset and figure it out? It's there. So it's like, you know, if, are you feeling stuck? Do you want more growth? Because some people that come um, to this retreat, retreat they're, it's not their first rodeo. You know, they, they've got this business and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. And we watch them every single year, but they're still coming because you still get something out of it. Right. You know what I mean? You still have to challenge yourself. The moment you get comfortable, we all know that's when we get stuck, right? So are you going to put the time in to uncover the depths of your brain? <laughs> I love that you say the depths of your brain because it's like, you got to understand how your mind works. I mean, you know this, I, you probably know that my tagline is know yourself, do anything. When I say know yourself, I don't just mean like know your likes and dislikes. You have to know the darkness of your mind. And I'm not like, when I say know yourself, it's like, you need to know how your mind bullshits you. You need to know how your mind lies to you. You need to know how your mind tries to separate you and keep you as the other. Cause that is the function of the ego, right? To keep us separate, to keep us protected. And when you know that, then you can do anything, right? You have to really, and put in the work, put in the action, like you said. I love it. Your, your biggest growth moments lie next to your ugliest truths. So if oh. you don't seek them, you don't get to that next level. 
So I love that you said ugly is truth because here on the Being Human with Most of Me podcast, I, what I want really for my listeners to walk away with is like, I bring on these people that are amazing. You are amazing. Obviously everyone is amazing in their own way, but you have created something beautiful for women. You have gone through a shit ton in your life that a lot of two-year-olds, you know, haven't had to go through. And I want people to see like, you didn't just wake up like this, right? You like, you didn't just become Dr. You know, Rubina Ahmed, who has this positive mindset, who has a, everything is, you know, figure outable mindset, who's willing to do whatever it takes. You were not born this way. You were primed. You, you were trained literally from a young age to be this person. Maybe you were born this way a little bit, right? By the grace of God. And, and so, but, but I really want our listeners to see is like, you talk about the ugliest truth. What is an ugly truth that you've had to face in your life? Let's just say in the past, you know, one to three years. One to three years. Oh my goodness. So, um, I, my daughter's two, I had a baby. Um, I was like, Oh, I got this. I'm in healthcare. I know all the warning signs, totally got this figured out. Um, 10 weeks after having my daughter's name is Viana, hadn't left the house. I was terrified. Um, my husband went to go work out at Orange Theory like 15 minutes after he left. And my daughter is like 11 weeks old at this time. I'm like texting him, like, are you coming back? Like, where are you freaking out? And I'm like, what is this? What's going on? I don't have time to get to know myself again. I already did this. I, already, I don't want to do this. No. By resisted it for so long, but at the same time, I wasn't leaving the house. I lost my marbles at this point, mm -hmm. and it and it wasn't like a depression, like like a classic, like I don't want my kid. It was like I really like my kid, but I also really like my life before a kid. Yeah. Kind of feeling guilty. I can't leave the house. I'm not prepared for this. Mm -hmm. um, that was really hard because I really liked where I was. You know, I was learning. I had this flow. Um, even while pregnant, I was like, oh, I can still do all these things. And you have a kid and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't, I don't want another learning curve. And that was bad. I felt guilty for a long time. So how did you make peace with that? How did you make peace with that ugly truth, with that guilt that you were living with? By the way, a lot of mothers would not admit that, right? A lot of moms are like, I love having kids. It's a great. And like, I, thank you so much for admitting that as much as you love your daughter, and I know you do like that motherly love is like, you, you know, you can't, you can't put words to it, but thank you for admitting that you also really missed your life before that. Like there is nothing wrong in admitting that, that that's what makes you human. Right. So how did you, how did you make peace with that, that guilt? So what I love to do, um, and you know, I think you said to me one day recently, you don't like the word pivot and innovate. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate those words too. And I, and I told Parisha that you said that. And she's like, yeah, I don't like those words either. So I call, I call it upgrading or yes. like the new tricks. Yeah. You know, um, I had to reprioritize, but that was kind of cool. So I was like, okay, what am I juggling? I'm, you know, a mom, a wife, you know, the home front is, is really important to me. Right. I've got the positivity charge. I've got a couple other, lots of other things on the go. Uh, I had to let some things go. Very hard to do, but I got to this point where I was like, okay, it's not like I'm letting things go. I've just kind of outgrown them. You know, I'm going to miss them because they were great parts of my life. Uh, but now I've got to focus on, you know, one, two, three, four, five, instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, which is Can really easy to do when you're like, well rested and not waking up in the middle of the night to feed a kid. <laughs> Can you give an example just for our listeners? Uh, like I, I want them to really hear like what it means to let something go. Like give me an example of something that you had to let go that you were comfortable with, you know, but you had outgrown it. Um, oh man, I think that I had to, you know, there's a lot of content on the Positivity Charge website. And so I was doing a lot of it because I love writing. That's just kind of this creative side of me. Um, that's always been sort of easy. So I had to stop writing every week. Mm. Had to become maybe once every two weeks or, or fitting it in here and there. Um, and then we had to outsource some of the positivity charge. So, you know, bringing on more people, uh, very hard to do when it's like your baby, like your other baby. And it's like, oh, you're going to, you're going to do this now. And like, you love it. And you totally trust that person. And they're completely the right person to be channeling the message and mission of our company. But it was like, I like doing that. I, I want to wake up, have a coffee and do that. And then it's like, okay, Rubina, no you know, someone else, like we're growing, there's other people with talents, like let them in, just let these people in, 
you know? Um, and then I started to do um, phone calls with my daughter. So I would be talking to like really important people who are part of the positivity charge, whether it be a sponsor or a speaker. And I would be like, my daughter's on the call and she would scream. And I was very unapologetic about it. I was like, she's on the call. And I kind of, people were just kind of like, oh, Rubina doesn't really seem to be too bothered about it. Okay, like maybe this is just going to be a thing. And it became a thing. Good for you. So you, so you let go, so like delegation, I understand, like, especially when it's your baby, you know, yeah. um, I don't mean your actual baby, like with the writing, like that's your baby. You started that from nothing. The delegation piece, I think, especially for women is so hard because we pride ourselves on being able to do it all. And you were like, you know what, if I want to grow, I got to be able to delegate, delegate certain things. I love that you brought, I love that you were unapologetic about your daughter being on the phone because I see a lot of moms who apologize for their children. And I'm like, why are you apologizing for your children? That's your child. That's like another human being. And I love that you were just like, yeah, my daughter's on the call. My daughter's yeah. on the call. Mm -hmm. so you really created that new normal for, for the people in your life, whether it's like speakers or sponsors. So I love that. So, you know, releasing that guilt really looked like upgrading, delegating, yeah. and uh, being unapologetic for your life. And part of, and your life, you know, now includes a daughter, now includes another human being that's going to be there, you know, so that's, that's beautiful. So everyone listening, you know, it's, it's like, you could stay comfortable or you can do the things that are the most uncomfortable because that's really when growth happens, right? When we decide to like, okay, I'm resisting it, but let me let go a little bit. And I'm sure you have space for so much more now in your life, right? Yeah, you know, I love the word abundance. It's kind of, you know, my theme right now. You've got to let things go to make room for other things, you know, as you continue to, to elevate. And I just roll with it. You know what I mean? I think there was one day I was on the phone and I put it on mute because my daughter, Bianca, went number two. And I was like, <laughs> I just got to make everyone that. really happy right now. So I I was like, okay, we're, we're talking about something. I technically can just say yes or no for like the next five minutes. I've got her in one arm, cell phone in another. Uh, I run upstairs. I'm changing her. I'm still talking. You know, she's in a new diaper. I'm like, you're not going to wear pants for the next five minutes. Who cares? Put her down. Take the cell phone into the bathroom. Wash my hands. This person had like no idea. <laughs> no idea. She's like, that was a great call, Rubina. Thank you. I'm so happy we connected. I'm like, amazing. You know, hang up that call lying on the floor. Like, oh my God, like this is so hilarious, but it's so possible. Yeah. You know, like nobody really needs to like, know. you don't have to prep someone all the time and say, oh, I'm doing this and this at the same time. Just do it. Just do, do it. People are more accepting of these things than we think. I just yep. don't think women are talking about it. And I, you, you mentioned something before. I thought it was really, really strange that I'm like, you know, like three months with a three month old sitting here like, okay, do we really like this? Like, like I was really confused. Like, I love my kid to death, but I'm like, there is not enough people being like, what the hell is going on? You know? I am so happy that you said that. And I think that's, that's a part of a lot of the depression that sets in with mothers is that they feel like they need to be like so grateful and you can be grateful, but also be like, what the hell just happened? I just pushed a human out of my vagina and I'm like, what, what is going on right now? You know? And I, I don't think enough women say that I have never had kids. My sister is very open about like the, what the hell factor with her two kids. She's a doctor. Um, she's an oncologist and she'll be like, yeah, they're just being crazy. And I'll always be like, they're being kids. Stop it. And I have to like check myself and be like, let her say that they're crazy. Why am I like, let her, that's her experience of her children right now. So I, I check myself with that. You know what I mean? So I think you're right. We do need to give more permission. Women need to give ourselves, give, give themselves permission, but society too has kind of expected women to just always be kind of like, oh, I'm so happy to have kids and I can't say anything bad about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So these, these next few questions, um, I'm excited about. So let's just, we're going to get right into it. So okay. number one, what makes you uniquely human? What makes me uniquely human? Um, I learned to love myself. I think that that's like what I say to everyone. When people are like, hey, Rubina, what do you do? I'm myself. That's what I started saying a couple years ago. And people are like, well, what do you do? No, I'm really myself. I'm also a mom, a chiropractor, um, you know, fat co-founder of this amazing like women's community. Um, but I think it's really cool to say that. I don't think a lot of people do. 
You know, you ask a lot of, you ask a hundred women, I'll be probably one of like three that say that. So let's, I want, I want everyone to hear that again, to answer to that question. So Rubina, what makes you uniquely human? I'm myself. That's great. Okay. Well, yeah. number, <laughs> number two, was there ever a time where you felt like you had to put on a facade and you couldn't show up in your full humanity? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been a, a couple of times, um, you know, I think as a chiropractor being very, you know, into like natural ways of healing, I think that there's been a couple of times that I've been networking with medical doctors and being like really reserved about it, but then coming back home and really feeling like crap, like why didn't I just tell them, you know, about my passion um, and give them examples and kind of give them some highlights, something to go home with, you know, when you seed plant, when you, when you tell people about yourself and you're not afraid, they remember it. They might not remember it that night, um, but the biggest lesson is people will remember these things later on. And so, you know, after some time, you know, I really got comfortable with that. And now I have a lot of medical doctors that come into the office, but I don't know why, like, you know, when we were in chiropractic college, you know, there was always this like tone of like, oh, medical doctors don't like us. And so like now in retrospect, I kind of wish like maybe some of those teachers didn't say that because they really feel like it kind of like gave me a complex, Absolutely. you know, and it didn't need to be there. <laughs> It's like they're, they're projecting their own stuff onto you. And it's like, if people have, if people got to manage what they say, right? Because you may have your crappy experience of something, but then put it, you're, you're literally tainting like this, 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 these virgin ears of these new chiropractors, right? So like, keep your, keep your opinions to yourself. And I think that's, that's great insight. Like, because now you're saying that you have good relationships with the medical doctors. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you have to always remember too, like your profession is not everybody's cup of tea and it's totally fine. Like whatever you do, you know, yeah. you just got to keep it moving, you know, keep, keep it moving. So was, what was the moment? So we talked about, you know, was there ever a time where you felt like you had to put on a facade? What was the moment when you decided you were done trying to look perfect or good for the outside world and just allow yourself to be human, to be yourself? I think that, you know, there's just a lot of times growing up, you know, or maybe just in general where, you know, I was, so kind of going back to like my mom, right? When she was sick, I really felt self-conscious about socializing because I kind of felt, you know, I was, I was home a lot and like, you know, I had a few close friends, but I really wanted to just to meet more people. And I felt like I was practicing and, you know, I was like rehearsing things here and there. And then at one point I was like, oh, I kind of got to go back to that mindset that I had. I just kind of like have to like give it my all, right? Like just have a conversation with people, just put words out there that you believe in. So like, if you always are saying something that you're, you're so true about, you, you believe it, like you're never going to put yourself in a situation where you're like, oh crap. And I just had to keep reminding myself of that. Like, you know, there's a couple of times where I would be like, oh yeah, I like that show too. Never seen it. You know, like, <laughs> just why do you put yourself in these like situations where you just think for a second, like, oh man, I have to. Um, and so kind of just always like whatever I'm saying is like the truth. And then I never really feel like I can't sleep at night, you know? Thank you so much for saying that because I the, the part that really sticks out to me is like you can go sleep peacefully at night and mm -hmm. uh, I share my story a lot about being in recovery mm -hmm. and in the 12-step program rigorous honesty is the name of the game like I can't even tell a small lie like I can't because I mean of course I can I physically can do it but I cannot because secrets keep us sick right? Because I'll know that I lied. And then if I know that I've lied, my mind will just be focused on that instead of what's ahead of me, right? Creation, clients, living my best life. So it's like, I love that you said that because the easiest way, it, it's not easy, actually, the simplest way to unburden ourselves is to just tell the truth. Yeah. And, that is, and that is so, so difficult, obviously, because we worry about what people think. We want to be loved. We don't want to be felt, we don't want to feel left out. We don't want to be the other. So, you know, what do you think? I kind of just mentioned a little, I said a little bit about it, but in your opinion and just what you've seen in the world, what do you think stops people from allowing themselves to be human? We keep putting ourselves in rooms that do not match our purpose. 
So if you are in a space where you are tempted to, or you are not speaking your truth and these little things are slipping out and you tell a little small lie here and there just to get you through the night or the conversation or a new client or with a new friend, you're not living your purpose. You've got to rewind. You, you've got to figure it out. And that's okay. Like that's a great place to be because it's almost like you're at this epiphany where like I'm one step closer to like what I want. Mm -hmm. So like, that's the way you should think about it. So remove yourself from everything and think about the places where it's like easy for you to say whatever you want to say, you know, and, and it be accepted or, you know, laughed about like in good conversation, you know, go back to all of those places. Um, and you don't have to be in every room. I say that a lot. You don't have to be everywhere. People want to have um, personalities, brands, uh, or things that like are everywhere. Like you can't live like that right? Like the smaller, the better. So like bring it all in, bring it back home, reevaluate, and then go back into the world when you're ready. So instead of having this FOMO, this fear of missing out, I, I, I often have JOMO. I have joy of missing out because it's yeah. like you, not every room is for every person. Also what I really, I would love to hear your take on this. What about, see, I feel like we're both very lucky. Uh, you grew up in a house where your mom was very positive. And so I think, I think you being able to speak your mind was kind of fostered at a young age, it seems like. Same thing with me, you know, I, I, I come from a traditional Indian Hindu Brahmin household. We're like Orthodox Jews. We're like the most traditional conservative you can get. My parents are a different breed though. I got to tell you, I mean, when I told them when I was 12 years old, I needed to go to therapy, they were like, okay, you know, they used to come to therapy. So I'm very lucky that way. I really am. I know I'm not, not a lot of people are. I know a lot of my listeners, my audience here, you know, they have family members that suck the living life out of them. I know that a lot of them are maybe trapped in relationships and it, with their own family, right? So what do you say to that? Because when it's your family, right? We have this loyalty to our family, which I think is complete bullshit. I'm just going to say it. Like, I don't have loyalty to anyone but myself, to be honest, because I'm the most important person in my life. I got to be true to myself. What do you say to that person who, you know, it's hard for them to be human because they're in such close proximity with their family. What do they do? Yeah, you've got to you know, change the stimulus. That's what I say. So, you know, having brown parents is like living in Times Square all the time. Like there's just lights, there's, it's like all this like information overload. Like you go into your room and close the door and like you can feel your mom like standing outside the door. You're like, she's here. Like I, you know, you've got a brown mom. They know everything. Nothing is safe. Nothing is off limits. Um, and I learned this technique at an early age, because I went to therapy, not because I, you know, had that epiphany that you did, but that my mom was really sick. Um, and I had no idea what was going on. And so I learned to, you know, take a tennis ball or a ball, like a ball that's actually like, you know, bigger, the better. And you're holding this ball and you you put all of these people's feelings in the ball. So like if your brother wants you to like do more of X, Y, and Z, if your mom wants you to spend more time with her and listen to the gossip about one auntie versus another auntie, like whatever it is, like, you know, take this and then give it back to them. They don't have to actually be in the same room as you, but you, like you take this ball and you, you throw it, you chuck it. Like if you're mad, like go into the backyard and just be like, take your problems back. I don't want them. And like the physical motions of actually doing this, the person doesn't even need to be there. It's so cathartic. It's like this release, right? Because you're just reminding yourself that you hear all this noise. You can hear it. That's fine. But you're always giving it back. You know, you don't need it. I always tell my clients, I say, other people's urgency is not your urgency. Yeah. Right. I have clients that are, that are very, they're givers. Most, all, almost all my clients are just very giving, nurturing and, and, you know, to the point where they don't really give to themselves and they have nothing left for themselves. And, you know, there's this like, oh, if, if you get a text, you have to respond right away. I was like, no, you don't. You don't need to respond right away. I mean, unless you literally have to respond right away. Right. You, you gotta, you gotta know, you gotta be able to have that discernment and that refinement to know this is important. This is not right. And you, not everything requires a response. ASAP. And I love what you said. And it's easier said than done. Like, let's just be real. It's, but it takes practice. And I, I love the metaphor of the ball and be like, this is your stuff. You can hold on to that. It's like having to have that barrier around you, you know, just having to keep that, that invisible barrier around you. I, I picture this ball and it's like, oh, you don't get to draw the line. You, you know, you don't get to step those, you know, into this line, this proximity. It's harder with family, especially in the Brown community. 
I think all families don't have that dynamic. It's like, oh, well, we're family. We're family. So you, therefore, you, you, you have to think like us. You have to be like us. You can't step outside of the box. I know many people that struggle with really, truly uh, being successful because their own family really didn't have, they didn't have a model of success. So they kind of feel like they don't want to outshine their parents. That's a huge pill to swallow. It's tough. It's tough. And you've got to, you know, really at an early age, be like, it's okay. And I think that setting boundaries is fun. I mean, there's some sort of like euphoric feeling that comes from saying no to people. I remember when I had my first practice, I lived in Toronto and it was a long weekend and my friends invited me to Niagara Falls. And I'm like, oh, it's a long weekend. Like my parents are brown, I gotta go home. And then I was like, I'm not gonna do this year. And I, I remember calling my mom and I was like, mom, I'm, I'm not coming home this long weekend. And it's like, what? And there's a silence and she's like, are you joking? And I was like, nope. I'm like, gotta go. And there was just something about that, that I was like, I did it. And it was like such a victory. And then it just becomes easier and it becomes like fun. Cause like you're in control. You Dude. Know? Oh my God, guys, everyone listening, like talk about a freaking mindset shift. Talk about a shift in perspective that setting boundaries is fun. By the way, it's like thundering outside. And right when you said it, it started rumbling. I'm like, that's a sign. That's like God being like, yes, setting boundaries. Can I tell you something? I never saw it that way. I just, I had to set boundaries because I had to, because I had so many toxic people in my life. And I, I was also toxic to myself. Setting boundaries is fun. It's like a rush. It's like a, it's like a dopamine hit. It's like, nope. And then you just shut up. I love that. You're like, nope, gotta go. <laughs> That's hysterical. Oh my gosh. And like, you know what else I used to do too is like, I, you know, if my brother was annoying me, I'd be like, okay, what's the date? I'm not going to call my brother for like a month. And like every time you would call, I'd be like, ignore, ignore. And I was like, oh, I'm setting boundaries. I'm training them. Like my time is valuable, you know, and then they figure it out. And then when you start getting like this different level of respect, like you, you just, like, you keep it moving, but you're like strutting a little bit. You're like, this feels good. And then you just got to take that into like all other areas of your life. It's fun. It's fun. You are, you are a good example of, uh, I posted this the other day on my Instagram. I said, we train people how to treat us. Yeah. We train, we're literally training people. So like, if you feel like people are taking advantage of you, you've trained them to take advantage of you. Cause you, you're a pushover. You are, you're a pushover. You haven't set that boundary. And I love that you're like, okay, a month and ignore it. And like, that's really good. And it's not mean. And I want everyone to hear that. It's not mean. It may seem mean because it's like, oh, you're ignoring your brother. But that's the thing. We sacrifice our own inner peace and our respect for ourselves for the sake of other people. But I'm assuming, I, I'm, I'm going to assume your relationship with your brother is maybe a little bit better now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, you know, you keep building this level of respect. I respect his time. He respects my time. But the other flip side of this is, you know, you then become comfortable, you know, not having to talk to someone all the time. You know, it's like this understanding of like love and support is like really there, but you never challenged it. So you didn't like really know how powerful it was. So like, even if I don't talk to him for like a week or two weeks, you know, as soon as like a text message gets serious or as soon as like I've got a question message, you know, goes through, um, you just know like the level of support you're going to get. Like you, you know, it's a really good way to like remind yourself, like, you know, and, and even with your parents or your friends, like sometimes you just need this space, but if you're looking at it the right way, it will actually give you a lot of valuable information about how strong those relationships actually are. Like they can be annoying, you know, and hair pulling moments. That's great, but always make sure you can see the other side of it as well. I love that. I love that. We, you know, especially in the Indian culture and it being brown, we like, I have always called my parents every day. And for the past, I would say six months, I maybe talked to my mom and dad, maybe three times. I talked to my dad every day. He's retired. And so like, I'm the light in his life. So I call him every day just to check in and see how he's doing, you know, but like, there's no obligation. We don't feel my parents are in Philly. There's no obligation. Like I have to call my parents every day. You know, um, I, I call them because I want to. And my mom is like, she, you know, she sings Indian Carnatic music and she's doing her thing and I'm happy, like go do your thing. And it's like, we don't feel the need to talk to each other every day. And um, 
I think that emotional psychological dependence is really unhealthy. And especially in the Brown community, you know, we can, we can be 45, 35 and still be kids to our parents, but it's up to us to have to kind of adult and not, and have to cut that cord because our parents won't do that. Our parents won't cut the cord with us. I love that you said that. Um, lastly, you know, what is, what does being human mean to you? You know, being human, you know, anytime you're saying the word self, I think, so self-respect, self-love, right? It all comes back to that. Like you can, being human has so many elements. Like it's, it's a, that's a very loaded, loaded question and I like it, but you know, everything that we want to say about being human, like being nice to others and giving back here and helping someone here and having a positive business and X, Y, and Z, like, yeah, you can say all that stuff, but if you don't have the, the self-discovery, the self-respect, the self-love, the self-care, none of those things really matter, you know? And so it all starts with, you know, the human self. I love that. So, and I think also being okay with being, um, focused on self. We often think that we're being selfish, right? If we're focused on ourselves, but how can we truly be kind and be human to other people when we have not extended that grace to ourselves, that graciousness to ourselves, that patience with ourselves. So I know that you got something really cool. You know, you mentioned before, you mentioned that you love content, you love to write. So I'm really, uh, I'm excited about this new thing that you got going on to help people with curating their content. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Who is it for? What do they get? Tell me why you love it. Yeah, I love it because life is, you know, many pieces of a puzzle. Um, and so I've had the opportunity to put a few puzzles together in my life. And I've always had this knack for writing and being able to write things so people will be like, I kind of want to know a little bit more about that. It's just been this thing inside of me. And so I spent a lot of time really trying to curate that. I'm now working with a literary agent. So there might be a surprise on the horizon like next year. Um, but it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, if I only knew this like 10 years ago, it's kind of like one of those scenarios. Like I really want to help people who are just putting up their website, um, new bloggers, medium sized bloggers, um, medical doctors, chiropractors, people starting a business. And you're like sitting there and you're like, I have all these like ideas in my head, but like, how do I put this on a website or how do I organize this? And so I get to work with different business owners. They tell me their story. I package it up really nicely and I organize it. And I'm like, here, and they're like, wow, this is exactly what I was saying. How did you know that? And it's just this thing. I get it. I get your story. I love hearing your story, like organizing all the pieces and the plot lines and then putting it out there so other people can read it and be like, this is amazing. I want to go here or I want to know more. I want to read your blog. Um, so I've kind of started that, you know, I've been a chiropractor for 15 years. So at the end of the day, the reality is, you know, I don't know how long my body is going to do this for. Mm. <laughs> so I've always kind of thought about like, you know, what's, what's my next career? What's like the next thing that I'm going to do. Um, and it's helping people tell their story through words. I have a way with words and I used to actually be very, timid about that. I was like, I don't want to tell people that I love this or, you know, I was able to write this like, you know, tagline or this headline in 10 seconds. I'm never going to tell anyone. And so, you know, to be, go back to that self stuff, I really have to like now be like, this is a thing. This is a thing. I'm putting it out there. I love, I'm writing down here, owning your gifts because so like so many things come to mind, right? I love that. Yes, you've been a chiropractor for 15 years and you're also tapping into other gifts that you have. And I say this to all my clients and I was like, you have a lot of gifts and you can use them in multiple ways. I love that you're helping people, business owners take their stories because here's the thing, we're not born being good writers, right? That is a skill that you have taught yourself that you have learned. And so if someone's not a, the most you know, uh, prolific writer and they, and they have all this ideas and you, they can come to you and you can help extract it and put it out on a website, like, because that's, you know, your website's like your storefront. That's the first place people go to. I think that's absolutely smart, for lack of a better word, that you're doing that. Um, I, I was telling this to a colleague the other day. I was like, yeah, I make like an extra two grand a month doing voiceover work. And she was like, you do? I was like, yeah, I'm a freelancer on Fiverr. I, I record people's podcast intros and outros. Like podcast, like now that it's, you know, quarantine, everyone's starting a podcast, which I think is awesome. Please do that but I get hired to do their voiceover, their, their voiceover, right? Like the intro and outro. Love it. I just think it's like, 
And for everybody listening, like you may have a job right now or you may have your own business, but like, don't, don't take it for granted. The stuff that comes to you that you've had to work your ass off. Like, you, have, you know, you weren't born a good writer, Rubina. You know what I mean? You have to, you have to cultivate that. You have to refine that. And so I think it's amazing that you're doing that for people and you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. And you're like, you know, you, you know, you're not going to be a chiropractor forever. And that's really cool. And you love people's stories and what a, what a great service to provide somebody. The new tricks. That's what I say. You know, now with coronavirus, it's a really good time to manage your skill set. Again, you know, what do you, what do you like to do? What problems do you like to solve? You know, and I remember sitting there, um, oh man, I should really dig up this email. But I think like 10 years ago, I told my uncle in an email, like I guest blogged for like some big blogger in Toronto. And I was like, I emailed like an entire Brown family. I was like, you guys better click on this. Okay, you need some hits, you know? Like that's what I was doing. And I remember my one uncle wrote back and he's like, oh, this is really great. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be in the Huffington Post one day. Six years later, it happened you know, six years later. And I remember just sitting there and, you know, writing down like a headline about like, I don't know, like, for example, like five things you should eat every morning. And I'm like, no, I know it needs to be something better. And it was like literally rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it, and then like the 30th thing. And then I could do it in like the 20th thing. And like, now I can look at something and you'd be like, rewrite it and be the fourth thing, you know? So yeah, I did put a lot of, you know, time and effort into it, but it, it's fun. It's back to that thing. It's like, it's fun. I love that challenge. And when something like ignites you in that way, you should always pursue it and uncover it and, and try to make it into something that, you know, you've always wanted. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I highly respect people who are, I mean, I, I respect all humans, but I really like, I have such a thing for people who are good with words because, and there's a thing with like, I consider myself to be a somewhat good verbal communicator. Written, I've had to learn. I don't, I, I think it would take me like 50 tries to do my headline. I'm getting pretty good with the headline stuff like marketing copy and stuff like that. But man, I have this like bow down respect for people who are great with words because like we are consuming words all the time. And it's like, that's the stuff that like will, will catch people's attention. And it's like, if you have the ability to do that, I'm like so happy for you and not to sound uh, like I'm, um, I'm not uh, patronizing you, but like, I'm really proud of you. I'm really proud of you that you're like, you know what? I've worked my ass off to be this good. And I'm going to offer this to other people. Like, I love that you're, that you're owning that about you. I appreciate that. It was a little bit scary to say. It's like, you know, you're, you're going out there being like, okay, I'm good at this. Trust me. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's like really scary. And I think it's easier being a chiropractor because you've got this like diploma. You're like, here, trust me. It's totally fine. You know what I mean? But it's like, you know, for content, like it's just, you just have to say it. You just have to like, you know, show people, you know, here are my examples. Here's what I've done. Like, let's do this together. Trust me, trust me, walk with me, you know, verbal diarrhea, tell me your story. And I promise to flip it to you. And you're, you're going to love it. And you're going to be like, wow, I get it. This is me. This is me. When people, like, when I flip something back to someone and they're like, this is so me, I'm like dance of joy all day. I, you know what? I might take you up on your content curation because, you know, I like to think I'm great talking about, like, I can write about myself, but I'm always like, I wonder what somebody else would say about me, right? And that's the thing. You can be really proud of your accomplishments and, like, you can know yourself. Like, I know myself inside out. But to capture that beautifully with words is a whole different beast you know so it's like I would love to work with you to do that I'm just letting you know I think that's we'll do it yeah we'll absolutely it. I think that's a great skill to have and all y'all listening whether you're starting a business or you have an existing business and you want to kind of revamp the words because here's the thing folks here's the thing if you have boring copy people will not buy from you. They're going to look at it and they're going to be like, like you got to capture people with words. And so if you're looking for somebody, Dr. Rubina did not ask me to do this. I'm just a huge believer in like, if, if you know that writing is not necessarily your skill set yet, hire someone to do it for you. You know, just get that help, yeah. like delegate, like, like you said that you did as well with your writing of your blog. You know what I mean? Like just, just ask for that help. Um, any, any parting words, Rubina? For our audience yeah absolutely just love yourself and you know some people if you don't know where to start you, you did you woke up that's your starting line so just 
forget about everything, wake up, and you got this. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode on the Being Human with Vasavi podcast. For even more inspiration, motivation, and no BS advice on how to get anything you want in life, book a call with me over at vasavikumar.com. If you love today's episode, be sure to screenshot it and tag me at Hire Vasavi, H-I-G-H-E-R Vasavi. Feeling extra generous? Leave the podcast a positive review on iTunes. And remember this, when you know yourself, you can be, do, and have anything you want.